When day turns to night, and the moon is hidden from sight, shed the king of you and wear the queen. The nine realms will open and your magic be free. Hi, my bling. It's your favorite drag witch, Nova Jupiter Jenkins. My friends call me Nova JJ, and you can too. If this is the first time joining us, I recommend heading back and listening to the previous episodes to get caught up on the sitch with this witch, but here's the short version. My alter ego Adam casts a spell every full and new moon and is transported to a magical realm I call the Heath. And as he's transported, he's transformed into me. Renowned book hunter and witch extraordinaire, Nova JJ. I record a podcast while I person the information desk at a library of infinite size called Kalamudutu. Occasionally I'm joined by my half-raven, half-feline familiars, Hugo and Munzee. Welcome to the Black Rock Moon episode. This moon was named by the cutest whittle tribe of Wormbles. They're sort of like wombats, but they use rudimentary technology and have the ability to burrow through space-time. They're simple people, but they're so adorable, so they got to name this new moon. Okay, my most humble apologies for the lack of a full moon episode last month. You may remember in the last episode I talked about the spell I was going to use to find my enemies. Well, it worked. And they had another fun little surprise for me. Can you guess what it was? It was zombies. Gerald, spoilers! But yes, those mother effers had a horde of zombies waiting for me. And can you even believe it? I can believe it. I mean, blood wolves are one thing. I mean, they're a bit temperamental, and they shed like crazy, and they might have given some of the library denizens heartburn, but, you know, they have their own kind of charm. But zombies are not cute any way you slice it. Or them. And I had to slice a lot of them. I felt like I was making zombie sandwiches for days. Fortunately, we were nowhere near the city. It's been a while since I talked about it, but if you remember, there is only one city, and it has multiple geographic occurrences throughout the heath. My adversaries had cast the original Blood Wolf spell from a grove in the frost forests of Thialmasuk. Of course, they were long gone from there, but as I suspected, there was a trace of their magic which led me to a network of caves that was a hop, skip, and a nightmare away. You didn't think it might be a trap? Well, of course it was a trap, silly, but zombies... So tacky and overdone. And messy. I got gore all over a cloak that I had just finished crocheting. Do you know how hard it is to get gore out of intricate crochet work? Even with magic? Fortunately, the yarn was spun from the wool of volcano sheep, so it's fireproof. I had to stick that thing in the fire for a whole day before the detritus burned away completely. Uh, The attackers got away again, but I was able to at least confirm that there were two of them, and only two of them. That will make it a bit easier to narrow down the best temporary spells for my Bat-Thame. For those who didn't catch the last episode, Bat-Thame is short for Battle-Athame, a ritual dagger used specifically for magical fighting. Anyway, I'll fill you in on further developments, uh, when and if they happen. Fear not. Insert segue here. Next, I want to talk about a controversial topic within the philosophy of magic, and that's... Wait, what's that? Munzee, what do you have in your mouth? Oh my goodness, Gerald, do you know what this is? An invitation to the mayor's solstice ball. No, I got that moons ago. No, it's regarding you. Do you want to guess? Not particularly. Gerald, you can be such a ghost in the mud. Go on, guess. My invitation to the solstice ball. (laughs) Very funny. No, it's your invitation to remain in the library. Oh, goody. So everyone, it's Gerald's name day. As you may remember from way back in the first episode, when he was alive, he was known as Corgon the Mighty. But when you die here in the library, your ghost is given a name that starts with a G. I know, a little on the nose, but that's librarians for you. Anyway, it's because the librarians aren't sure they want to keep the ghosts around. 
After a trial period, the length of which is a mystery determined by the librarians, they make the decision on whether the ghost can stay or not. Tell them what happens if we choose not. Well, since ghosts are tied to the place where they died, the other option to staying is oblivion. It's tempting. Gerald. Anyway, so once you're invited to stay, you get to pick a new name. Some people go back to using the name they used when alive, though that's considered a little gauche. Some people keep their first ghost name, like Gulia. When alive, she was born into a body that did not match her gender identity. You may remember back in episode 6 that I mentioned her name was Julia before she died, but unfortunately that was only in her heart. So when she died and her ghost form reflected her gender identity and she was automatically given what she considered a female name, she wanted to hold on to it even after her name day. Do you have your name selected, Gerald? Yes. What is it? I can't take the suspense. Gerald. Gerald? Gerald. Well, that's fantastic. Can I ask what made you choose that name? said I could record some stories. Yes, that's true. You can definitely record some stories. But what does that have to do with your name? I wanted to use alliteration and call them Gerald's Yarns. And that seems an odd reason to permanently select a name. I mean, you could have changed it to a hard G and called it Gerald's Ghost Stories. Don't be ridiculous. Right, well... Whatever the reason, uh, we will need to have a celebration later. Also, everyone keep an eye out for Yerald's Yarns coming to a podcast feed near you. I have a feeling they might particularly be enjoyed by the ASMR crowd. But for now, I want to get back to what I was talking about before Yerald's name day tangent. As I mentioned, this philosophy of magic topic is a bit controversial. It's the idea of using magic to help others without their knowledge. It seems like a great idea, just a little mojo to give a friend an extra boost in their job hunt or to help that lonely cousin find love. Some people take the Amelie approach and see it as random acts of kindness. What could be the harm in that? The main issue, both with the magical and the mundane version of helping someone without their knowledge or consent, is the unforeseen consequences. And when it comes to magic, those consequences can be amplified and have a much longer-lasting effect. Of course, any action we take is capable of having unforeseen consequences, but casting a spell for someone when they may have their own magic in the works, or if they're putting out an energy at cross-purposes, can be pretty disastrous. Some people may be morally, spiritually, or religiously opposed to having magic done on their behalf. I always say, when in doubt... Consent it out. What I try and do when I want to help someone is to create a charmed object that can assist them and offer it to them as a gift, or more often ask them in advance so as to save time and ingredients. Most times people will gladly accept, and the energy from their anticipation can even strengthen the charm. As they say, teamwork makes the spell work, or something like that. And that's going to bring us to Craft Corner. During the last new moon, I talked about some offensive magic with a bat to me. This time I'd like to talk about some defensive magic as it pertains to gift charms. One of the charms I like to offer people is a gift of protection, especially if I know they're going to be facing a tough fight or even if they're just going on a long trip. The main ingredient is just a stone that has a flat side. It's preferable if the stone can be obtained from around the home of the individual for whom the charm is being made. On the flat side, I'll carve the rune Algiz, which is a rune of protection. If you take the peace symbol, turn it upside down and remove the circle, you get an idea of what it looks like. Once the rune is carved in, I paint into the grooves with a mixture of the recipient's saliva and breath. The stone then goes into a pouch that I've crocheted for the occasion, sometimes out of yarn made from the recipient's pet's hair. The pouch can then hang around the neck of the person, and they can enjoy some measure of protection in battle or on their journeys. Easy as a moderately complicated pie.
Okay, let's get to story time and the continuing adventures of Eric John Stark in the Black Amazon of Mars. To recap, our hero, Eric John Stark, human raised on Mercury, was taking his Martian friend Kamar back to Kamar's home city of Kushat to return an important talisman to the city before Kamar died of the wound he'd received saving Stark's life. The talisman is the ancient talisman of Ban Kruak, and it has given Stark visions of cities under the ice of the polar cap of Mars, cities peopled by disturbing creatures. When Kamar died before they could reach the city, Stark was taken prisoner by the Wolves of Mech, an army of nomadic warriors who are planning to take Kushat by force. The Wolves are led by the cold and merciless Lord Sierran, who always wears a black mask so that none may see his face. After he was tortured for the whereabouts of the talisman, Stark fought his way free and escaped on the back of one of the reptilian steeds that are used in this region of Mars. Bruised and bloodied, he made his way across the plains and finally reached the city of Kushat. Once inside, he was assisted by a young woman named Thanis and her brother Balin. They've warned the guards and the nobles of the impending attack and are anxiously awaiting to see if Stark was right or if the nobles will execute him for a false alarm. And now, Part 5 of The Black Amazon of Mars. They waited. Some distance away, a guard leaned against the parapet, huddled in his cloak. He glanced at them incuriously. It was bitter cold. The wind came whistling down through the gates of death, and below in the streets the watchfires shuddered and flared. They waited, and still there was nothing. Balin said impatiently, "'How can you know they're coming?' Stark shivered, a shallow rippling of the flesh that had nothing to do with cold, and every muscle of his body came alive. Phobos plunged downward. The moonlight dimmed and changed, and the plain was very empty, very still. They will wait for darkness. They will have an hour or so between moonset and dawn. Thanis muttered, Dreams! Besides, I'm cold. She hesitated and then crept in under Balin's cloak. Stark had gone away from her. She watched him sulkily where he leaned upon the stone. He might have been a part of it, as dark and unstirring. Deimos sank low toward the west. Stark turned his head, drawn inevitably to look toward the cliffs above Kushat, soaring upward to blot out half the sky. Here, close under them, they seemed to tower outward in a curving mass, like the last wave of eternity rolling down crested white with the ash of shattered worlds. I have stood beneath those cliffs before. I have felt them leaning down to crush me, and I have been afraid. He was still afraid. The mind that had poured its memories into that crystal lens had been dead a million years, but neither time nor death had dulled the terror that beset Ban Kruak in his journey through that nightmare pass. He looked into the black and narrow mouth of the gates of death, cleaving the scarp like a wound, and the primitive ape thing within him cringed and moaned, oppressed with a sudden sense of fate. He had come painfully across half a world to crouch before the gates of death. Some evil magic had let him see forbidden things, had linked his mind in an unholy bond with the long-dead mind of one who had been half a god. These evil miracles had not been for nothing. He would not be allowed to go unscathed. He drew himself up sharply then and swore. He had left Nchaka behind, a naked boy running in a place of rocks and sun on Mercury. He had become Eric John Stark, a man, and civilized. He thrust the senseless premonition from him and turned his back upon the mountains. Deimos touched the horizon a last gleam of reddish light tinged the snow and then was gone. Thanis, who was half asleep, said with sudden irritation, I do not believe in your barbarians. I'm going home. She thrust Balin aside and went away down the steps. The plain was now in utter darkness under the faint, far northern stars. Stark settled himself against the parapet. There was a sort of timeless patience about him, Balin envied it. He would have liked to go with Thanis. He was cold and doubtful, but he stayed. 
Time passed, endless minutes of it, lengthening into what seemed hours. Stark said, Can you hear them? No. They come. His hearing, far keener than Balin's, picked up the little sounds, the vast, inchoate rustling of an army on the move in stealth and darkness. Light-armed men, hunters, used to stalking wild beasts in the snow. They could move softly, very softly. I hear nothing, Balin said, and again they waited. The westering stars moved toward the horizon, and at length in the east a dim pallor crept across the sky. The plain was still shrouded in night, but now Stark could make out the high towers of the king's city of Kushat, ghostly and indistinct. The ancient, proud high towers of the rulers and their nobles, set above the crowded quarters of merchants and artisans and thieves. He wondered who would be king in Kushat by the time this unrisen sun had set. "'You were wrong,' said Balin, peering. "'There is nothing on the plain.' Stark said, Wait. Swiftly now, in the thin air of Mars, the dawn came with a rush and a leap, flooding the world with harsh light. It flashed in cruel brilliance from sword blades, from spearheads, from helmets and burnished mail, from the war harness of beasts, glistened on bare russet heads and coats of leather, set the banners of the clans to burning, crimson and gold and green, bright against the snow. There was no sound not a whisper in all the land. Somewhere a hunting horn sent forth one deep cry to split the morning. Then burst out the wild skirling of the mountain pipes and the broken thunder of drums, and a wordless scream of exultation that rang back from the wall of Kushat like the very voice of battle. The men of Mech began to move. Raggedly, slowly at first, then more swiftly as the press of warriors broke and flowed, the barbarians swept toward the city as water sweeps over a broken dam. Knots and clumps of men, tall men, running like deer, leaping, shouting, swinging their great brands. Riders spurring their mounts until they fled belly down. Spears, axes, sword blades, tossing, a sea of men and beasts rushing, trampling, shaking the ground with the thunder of their going. And ahead of them all came a solitary figure in black mail, riding a raking beast trapped all in black and bearing a sable axe. Kushat came to life. There was a swarming and a yelling in the streets, and soldiers began to pour up onto the wall. A thin company, Stark thought, and shook his head. Mobs of citizens choked the alleys, and every rooftop was full. A troop of nobles went by, brave in their bright mail, to take up their post in the square by the great gate. Balin said nothing and Stark did not disturb his thoughts. From the look of him, they were dark indeed. Soldiers came and ordered them off the wall. They went back to their own roof where they were joined by Thanis. She was in a high state of excitement, but unafraid. Let them attack, she said. Let them break their spears against the wall. They will crawl away again. Stark began to grow restless. Up in their high emplacements, the big ballistas creaked and thrummed. The muted song of the bows became a wailing hum. Men fell and were kicked off the ledges by their fellows. The blood howl of the clans rang unceasing on the frosty air, and Stark heard the rap of scaling ladders against the stone. Thanus said abruptly, What is that? That sound like thunder. Rams, he answered. They are battering the gate. She listened, and Stark saw in her face the beginning of fear. It was a long fight. Stark watched it hungrily from the roof all that morning. The soldiers of Kushat did bravely and well, but they were as folded sheep against the tall killers of the mountains. By noon the officers were beating the quarters for men to replace the slain. Stark and Balin went up again onto the wall. The clans had suffered. Their dead lay in windrows under the wall, amid the broken ladders, but Stark knew his barbarians. They had sat restless and chafing in the valley for many days, and now the battle madness was on them and they were not going to be stopped. Wave after wave of them rolled up and was cast back and came on again relentlessly. The intermittent thunder boomed still from the gates, where sweating giants swung the rams under cover of their own bowmen 
and everywhere, up and down, through the forefront of the fighting, rode the man in black armor, and wild cheering followed him. Balin said heavily, It is the end of Kushat. A ladder banged against the stones a few feet away. Men swarmed up in rungs, fierce-eyed clansmen with laughter in their mouths. Stark was first at the head. They had given him a spear. He spitted two men through with it and lost it, and a third man came leaping over the parapet. Stark received him into his arms. Balin watched. He saw the warrior go crashing back, sweeping his fellows off the ladder. He saw Stark's face. He heard the sounds and smelled the blood and sweat of war, and he was sick to the marrow of his bones, and his hatred of the barbarians was a terrible thing. Stark caught up a dead man's blade, and within ten minutes his arm was as red as a butcher's, and ever he watched the winged helm that went back and forth below a standard to the clans. By mid-afternoon the barbarians had gained the wall in three places. They spread inward along the ledges, pouring up in a restless tide, and the defenders broke. The rout became a panic. "'It's all over now,' said Stark. "'Find Thanus and hide her.' Balin let fall his sword. "'Give me the talisman,' he whispered, and Stark saw that he was weeping. "'Give it to me, and I will go beyond the gates of death and rouse Ban Kruak from his sleep, and if he has forgotten Kushat, I will take his power into my own hands. I will fling wide the gates of death and loose destruction on the men of Mech, or if the legends are all lies, then I will die.' He was like a man crazed. "'Give me the talisman!' Stark slapped him, carefully and without heat across the face. "'Get your sister, Balin. Hide her, unless you would be uncle to a red-haired brat.' He went then, like a man who has been stunned. Screaming women with their children clogged the ways that led inward from the wall, and there was bloody work afoot on the rooftops and in the narrow alleys. The gate was holding, still. Stark forced his way toward the square. The booths of the hucksters were overthrown, the wine jars broken and the red wine spilled. Beasts squealed and stamped, tired of their chafing harness, driven wild by the shouting and the smell of blood. The dead were heaped high where they had fallen from above. They were all soldiers here, clinging grimly to their last foothold. The deep song of the rams shook the very stones. The iron-sheathed timbers of the gate gave back an answering scream, and toward the end all other sounds grew hushed. The nobles came down slowly from the wall and mounted and sat waiting. There were fewer of them now. Their bright armor was dented and stained, and their faces had a pallor on them. One last hammer stroke of the rams. With a bitter shriek the weakened bolts tore out, and the great gate was broken through. The nobles of Kushat made their first and final charge. As soldiers they went up against the riders of Mech, and as soldiers they held them until they died. Those that were left were borne back into the square, caught as in the crest of an avalanche. And first through the gates came the winged battle mask of the Lord Ciaran, and the sable axe that drank men's lives where it hewed. There was a beast with no rider to claim it tugging at its head rope. Stark swung onto the saddle pad and cut it free. Where the press was thickest, a welter of struggling brutes and men fighting knee to knee, there was the man in black armor, riding like a god, magnificent, born to war. Stark's eyes shone with a strange, cold light. He struck his heels hard into the scaly flanks. The beast plunged forward. In and over and through, making the long sword sing. The beast was strong and frightened beyond fear. It bit and trampled, and Stark cut a path for them, and presently he shouted above the din, "'Ho oh, there! Ciaran!' The black mask turned toward him, and the remembered voice spoke from behind the barred slot joyously. "'The Wanderer! The Wild Man!' Their two mounts shocked together. The axe came down in a whistling curve, and a red sword blade flashed to meet it. Swift, swift, ringing clash of steel— and the blade was shattered and the axe fallen to the ground. Stark pressed in. Ciaran reached for his sword, but his hand was numbed by the force of that blow, and he was slow, a split second. 
The hilt of Stark's weapon, still clutched in his own numbed grip, fetched him a stunning blow on the helm, so that the metal rang like a flawed bell. The Lord Sierran reeled back only for a moment, but long enough. Stark grasped the war mask and ripped it off, and got his hands around the naked throat. He did not break that neck as he had planned, and the clansmen who had started in to save their leader stopped and did not move. Stark knew now why the Lord Sierran had never shown his face. The throat he held was white and strong, and his hands around it were buried in a mane of red-gold hair that fell down over the shirt of mail. A red mouth passionate with fury, wonderful curving bone under sculptured flesh, eyes fierce and proud and tameless as the eyes of a young eagle, fire blue defying him, hating him. By the gods, said Stark very softly, by the eternal gods. Stay tuned next time for the continuing adventures of Eric John Stark in the Black Amazon of Mars. And that's going to do it for this Black Rock Moon episode. If you can, tell a friend, like, comment, and subscribe on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen. And remember, even though you should never look a gift horse in the mouth, it's okay to look at their hooves. Bye!